Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders you've heard of and some you've never heard of. Um, the founder of Big League Chew, RX Bar, P90X founder, Tony Horton, uh, you know, Einstein Bagels. You know, Dave, I love hearing about the challenge stories. You know, not just, okay, I've been successful, been there, done that, but I remember um, Noah Alper of Einstein Bagels said he was selling a uh, rel- religious tchotchkes out of the back of his trunk and mm. uh, was not doing so great in business. And then um, I, I love hearing those times as well as obviously the success on the other end and, and people sometimes, hopefully they realize it's like a 10 or 20 year journey overnight success, yeah. right? And right. so I love hearing those things. And I'm going to introduce today's guest in a second, which um, we use their software. We love it. And uh, so I'm excited to introduce it to you if you haven't heard of it. Um, But before I do, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And what we do at Rise25 is we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners and help them run and launch their podcast. Not just that, but so it generates ROI. Because we find that if someone does a podcast and it doesn't generate ROI, they quit. And yep. so we, I don't want anyone to quit. I've been doing this for over 10 years. And um, it's not just business related. It's allowed me to form amazing relationships. And it's much more personal. And the reason um, I started podcasting, inspiration behind it was my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor. And him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And they were the only members of their family to survive. And the reason his words and legacy live on is because the Holocaust Foundation um, did an interview with him. And actually that interview is on my about page on inspiredinsider.com. So people can watch the full interview, but it's something that inspires me, motivates me. I watch it multiple, multiple times a year. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I consider when I have a guest on helping them leave a legacy, not just, you know, we're talking about business, but help myself and my guests leave a legacy. And um, that's what it did for my grandfather. And so- I personally credit podcasting as the best thing I've done for my business and my life outside of meeting my wife. But um, if you have a business, I believe you should have a podcast, period. So uh, you can ask questions if you have them. Uh, Even if you don't use us, uh, support at rise25media.com and check out rise25.com for more information. And I'm excited about introducing today's guest. And um, also he's talks about business and his journey and it always it hasn't always been uh, amazing along the way but um dave navote founded hubstaff in 2012 out of personal pain and the need to be free so we'll hear more about that but they have over 34,000 businesses that trust hubstaff and they help companies like groupon instacart ring doorbell click funnels many more dave's founded several multi-million dollar businesses and says the software company was the hardest, one of the hardest things he's ever done. Um, Dave, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Nice to be here. So why is that out of everything been one of the hardest things? Oh, well, there's a lot of reasons really, but number one is that I just didn't have any clue how how to to do it or or what to do um, or how hard it was. Uh, You know, desktop software is, web software is a little easier. Um, It's a lot easier actually, Uh, but, desktop software um, is just so hard because there's so many different versions of operating systems and you have to, you know, con- conform to all those different um, mm. systems. Um, and it makes it very hard. So you have to find very smart people to be able to do that and build that code. Yeah. Talk about that for a second because there's a, there's a unique, um, a really good customer service aspect to your business. Yeah. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's an expensive software. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we get email from someone who's like, hey, let's set up a meeting and very high touch for mm-hmm. not uh, expensive software. So maybe just briefly talk about what the software is so people kind of know what Hubstaff is in general. And then we could talk about how you made sure to implement that customer service aspect. 
Yeah, so I mean, Hubstaff at its core is uh, time tracking with data. So um, timesheet verifications, we do, we try to streamline small businesses. And so anybody with remote teams, especially, um, which right now we're in this, you know, pandemic and it's, um, it's really helped a lot of people, you know, stay employed um, and, and helped a lot of companies stay in business. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of that. But, um, you know, we primarily help remote teams or teams that are not together in a physical office. It's our number one kind of um, uh, core competency. And um, that can be mobile where, you know, your, your team is, you get a construction company and you don't, don't know where your employees are. We track location. Um, we show location on a map. So you can see where your team is, even if you're all in Chicago, but you don't know, you know, uh, if you have one foreman that is on this job site and then you've got, you know, another job site coming over here and you got somebody on the other side of town, you can't physically get in a truck and drive around. That takes out, that would take four hours in Chicago, you know? So, um, you've experienced you know, that before versus a few seconds of logging in and seeing the location, making sure they are where they're going to be you know, how much time was spent with the client. So we, you know, you can scale that up to large companies that need to know how much time is being spent with customers, you know, for sales teams, um, you know, all these different things. You roll it up into reports. Um, and then we, you know, for remote teams, e-commerce, um, you know, agencies are a big one, soft development. Um, basically just understanding what, what is being done, setting priorities. You can see screenshots of your team. Um, we have a lot of people that are, that are half our customers are international. Um, outside the U.S. Um, and then most of our customers have employees or contractors outside the U.S. So, um, you know, across time zones, we help manage that. Um, you know, like I said, setting priorities, understanding what's being worked on, um, you know, how the work's being done, who's the most active, um, that kind of thing. Has there been a use case that has surprised you? Or that you, yeah, uh, what's, what's uh, surprised you? Yeah, I mean, one, for example, is like um, hospitals needing to use um, the software to basically uh, use it for the opposite. Most people want to know, most people want to, to use it to make sure to, to, to make sure that uh, basically somebody is working a required amount of hours. So say you have a company that now has to go remote and um, you want to make sure that your people are actually putting in 40 hours. You want to have that very simple use case. That's the, that's like a big primary use case of our software making sure people are doing what they're supposed to be doing when they're supposed to be doing it. Right. Um, the hospitals use it or, you know, a lot of times for residents, they can only work 80 hours a week mm. because of, you know, fatigue. And so what they use it for is make, they want to, because the residents want to, or they don't maybe not, not necessarily want to work more, but they're put in situations lots of times where they have to work more. Yeah. And so, or they're, you know, kind of pressured to work more. And so hospital is using this to actually limit the hours to 80. So you cannot go over this time. You cannot track time um, over this hour range per week, which was interesting. Mm. You know, it's funny because um, one, one of the reasons we wanted to implement is to get more visibility um, on hiring as far as mm -hmm. when do we need to hire someone else, right? Yeah. So is this person starting to get at max capacity or um, what tasks are they doing that maybe we need to separate out from their job? And so, right. you know, I could see someone wanting to track the time, but we wanted to get more visibility because you can, with the yeah. software, program different tasks at that person. You know, on an individual, on a daily basis, people are doing different tasks throughout the day. Um, what are the different tasks they're spending the most time on? Yep. Also, customers-wise, who's taking up most of the time. Yep. Right. In the 80, 20 rule. Those are both perfect examples. Like with the customer, most companies can't, most companies have a very hard time tracking profitability. So that that's one thing that we really uh, help with. Um, I mean, it, it all, the nice thing is it all happens automatically. Uh, not, I wouldn't say automatically hundred percent, but kind of automatically. And um, like you can tell, how much time is being spent on various different customers or clients. And then basically, you know, like a cleaning company, for example, a cleaning, uh, a, a maid service, you know, they'll have a, a, a one um, 
customer that their house takes two hours and they quoted for two hours, but it's actually taking, you know, three for what, for whatever reason, maybe they have very detailed steps. Maybe the customer is just, you know, just required acquiring extra time or whatever. That's an act that, that customer may, may be unprofitable over time um, in a business of low margins where another customer, they can fly in and out in an hour. And so you've got to, you can adjust pricing based on that, or you can, you know, go and, you know, a lot of what we do is to help companies and business owners kind of like adjust. Um, yeah. Another example, like you said, is um, I have a, I have an example like that as well, where uh, managers and owners, they don't understand what their people are doing. It's very hard to understand what your people are actually doing. I mean, they could be, and, and many times, most times it's not, it's not nothing. Um, it's nothing ill hearted or anything. Yeah. It's not a the, trust yeah, no, but not by the employee. They're not doing anything wrong. They're just trying to do their job, but they're doing it in a way, it's a management issue. And um, like, for example, when I ran my golf company, um, you know, I had this guy, he was awesome. He was, in, he was uh, our lead developer. I said, why are projects always running so slow? Why, cannot, why can't things ever get done on time? Why can't projects get done on time? I can't figure it out. You know, we, we, I th I'm doing everything I can to give you um, the, the resources to get these things done on time. I can't figure out why it's not getting done. So he, I mean, you know, he didn't have a really good answer for this. We started tracking time and all of a sudden you start tracking time to different projects. I, I realized in the course of just basically a week and I had been trying to solve this problem for a year and a half, two years. After a week of tracking time, I learned that he was actually spending like 40% of his time on customer service. So I can adjust then and say, right. now that's a, he thought that was his job. You know, he thought, and I was giving him that job unknowing that it was taking so much time, but he had to solve all the customer's issues. Why can't you log in? Why can't you reset your password? Right? Like things like that. Right. I could, I was paying this, this developer, right? Mm -hmm. Three times the, the weight, right? And, and my right. projects were going slow because of one problem that I could have easily adjusted for hired a customer service agent, right. And made an adjustment business, be, become more profitable get my project. So over, you know, in, you, until you're doing, until you're tracking time and you're getting data, it's very hard to understand these, these issues. They've talked about implementing it into the team. Um, people may be thinking, well, I don't want to my team to think I don't trust them. And then all yeah. of a sudden I onboard hub staff, what are, what's some language you recommend people using when someone is, um, you know, onboarding the team to using HubStaff? Yeah. And I think, I, I, well, I, don't, I think a lot of it comes down to the, to the, um, the transparency of a manager or an owner um, talking to their people about how they run their business and what they need. So some companies might not need this and some companies might not, uh, go down this route. Um, you know, it, so what I, I mean, no, no offense to you for that, but like, yeah, I think right. everyone does need that. I mean, I told, I mean, what I expressed was I am personally going to use it. This is not for everyone, but I want to track my productivity and what I may be wasting time on or what, you know, yeah. like having some visibility into that. So I think even as a, in, an owner standpoint, it's valuable. That's right. one, yeah, that's one angle. I, what, yeah. I, what I usually kind of think of is like more along the lines of like, okay, you know, I need this data as the owner because honestly, we, we have to make better decisions as a company, right? We yeah. have to make better decisions as a company. And without hiring, without you giving me feedback every day over Slack or, what, or over email, then I have to consolidate and I've got to roll that into reports. And then I've got to, right. You have to explain your job as the manager or the owner, the things that you have to do. So I have, I have to track down timesheets. I have to do payroll. I have to do, right. I've got to do invoicing of clients. This software is going to make all that automatic for, mm. for my company. It's going to make my job is to grow the business so I can hire more people or pay you as the employee more money, right? I can roll that back into you. I need to streamline what I'm doing. So um, with Hubstaff or, you know, many time tracking softwares or whatever, right? Like all, you know, how much you pay employees, how, if, if you pay by the hour, especially, um, or how much you pay contractors, how much you, 
invoice your clients, all of that happens automatically. And that's really where I think, um, and, and it, at most business owners, especially small business really, uh, struggle with that. You know, um, yeah. now if you're more in, let's say e-commerce where you don't have those issues, you don't have the issue of, you know, how much to invoice a client. You just have to figure out how much you want to pay people. And if they're on a salary, right, then it does become more about, okay, I need to know what projects you're working on so that I can, you know, understand how much time and how much cost is really going into that project. Is that something that has ROI for the business? So things like that, you know, I think um, are, are a good angle to go. So a conversation around transparency, why it's so important for the business, and then second, yeah. wow, it's benefiting them. Maybe it's saving them time because they were doing timesheets or tracking something and they won't right. have to do it anymore. And, and I'm a believer that if, that if if an employee or a contractor can't understand that, if they if they say, well, you know, still, I don't want this thing on my computer tracking what I'm doing. You know, if, they, if that's if that's what they're saying back to you, then it's like then they're then something's off, because that I'm a believer that employees and contractors are are are, are you know everyone's needs to be they need to understand the, from the business standpoint that it's a trade off, right? So they're getting income, and the business is hopefully getting ROI on that income, and if if that's not a if that circle and cycle is not happening then something is off. So if, if all you're thinking about is your side of the equation, then you're not worried about anything else that happens in the business. Then that's not, it's not a match. Like that's not a person that, that I want in my organization. If they can't understand that simple, you know, philosophy. Yeah. You know, I want to talk about the core values a little bit, but, but to the customer service question, um, you know, what made you decide to bake so much uh, customer service and touch into a software that it's not like, you're charging yeah. an ex exorbitant amount per month or anything like that. Yeah, it's a good question. It's hard to, that, that's actually pretty, uh, a, a very interesting conversation. I'm glad you, um, I'm glad you experienced that. I'm glad that, I'm glad that it was a good, um, you know, it sounds like it was a good experience for you. I'm glad it was. Um, so those, maybe it's because people are on, on, old desktop computers and you just needed it because people can't get it run, you know? Yeah. It, well, no, I, I mean, the thing, the, the thing is like that, you know, customer service is your first line of defense. They are, they, they are all true salespeople in um, their own way. And that is how we um, gain trust of our clients and a customer. So um, we can't afford because you said, like you said, we're, we're, our, our software is not expensive. So we can't afford to have a sales team. I mean, we, we could have a sales team if, but I don't think that say, we haven't found a way to make that profitable. Um, because our, our, our businesses are mostly small businesses and the average account pays us, uh, $50 a month, $60 a month now. So it's very hard to make those numbers work in a commission style or that kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, but what we do, what we do believe is that almost what we know is that almost every single customer customer that comes in, they ask a question. They have to ask a question in order to get the software up and running or they, you know, it's very, very unlikely that they have no issues onboarding their team because you have one owner, our software, you have one owner, which is another reason why this was a hard business to start is that you have one owner that's paying you, right? But then you have on average, like seven to 10 t people that are not paying you that are using the software day in, day out, um, yeah. that need to be, those are the, the, the team members are the ones that, you, that, that are using the software that everything needs to work. It takes just pretty much one or two of those people to say, Hey, this doesn't work or there's issues or I'm having this issue, no matter what they're doing. Uh, it could be just, yeah, you know, it's really true. tough because you need every single person to be on board. And if you're getting negative feedback, it's yep. going to be start the owner's going to start questioning the decision. So you need to, yes, exactly. Cause the, really the, 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 the team members are the ones that, that are the, if they onboard and it's, it's all good, then okay now, and they get good feedback, then great. Everything's fine. If, if, if you're making it a hassle, we need to make life easy for the owner, not harder. And you're making it harder. If, if mm -hmm. now everyone's got an issue, everyone needs help onboarding. Right. And that needs to be, so our team needs to be really good when it comes down to helping people get through it. Um, and we look at them as our salespeople because we don't, we don't have salespeople. So they're, they're really, 
Um, yeah, so that, that, that's, that's, I guess that's where my mind's at there. One of the things we did is I didn't want to make the decision off the bat. I wanted the team to research their top two choices mm -hmm. and then come to us because then if it's coming from them, they research it's easy or yep. it's not easy, then it's much, you know, yeah. then like you made the decision on it and that's what you chose essentially to, to find it the best and the easiest. And so we'll figure it out on our end, but we wanted them to be on board with using, actually using that's it. That's right? smart. Yeah, that, yeah, that's good to hear. That's interesting to hear. Yeah, I think that's what happens a lot. Um, and so from the customer service, talk about mapping that out because you're very detail oriented, obviously. Well, there's certain touch points you wanted with the customer service and, um, you know, and, and how methodical you are behind the scenes. Yeah, it's kind of hard because we have, like, we have, we have uh, e-commerce, we've got agencies, we've got software development, we've got construction, we've got, you know, all these different people coming in and they all, we don't have a software built specifically for any one industry. So it's hard to, to build those touch points exactly out. Um, we do have that data. So we, we're starting to kind of um, build out paths for our, for our most popular kind of like people that would resonate with one of those industries or whatever. Um, but it, it's been in general, you know, um, in general, it's just about, Hey, if you want a demo, we'll give you a demo. If, if you need, you know, in general, it's about the people that are coming in, how they like to learn and us being able to, to offer whatever it is that they need, um, mm -hmm. and being very upfront and honest or, um, uh, not, not demanding, but just, we want to make sure that they know where to get help if they want, if they need, and, right. and they need to get that help in in the, in the format that they want. Some of them want a PDF downloadable that they can email other people. Some of them want a video. Some of them want, you know, a, a live person that we do all, we just make sure that they yeah. have the sources that they need. I didn't know if there was some point, because I know, I don't remember how long we had been on it, but someone reached out and said, Hey, if you have questions or if you want to get on yeah. the phone, like, let us know. I didn't know yeah. if there was like a specific point where you see people maybe need a little more hand holding and they're just starting to get their footing on it. Is there a certain time period? No, not really. No. I mean, I think no. we just kind of set it up and okay. you know, just, yeah. Well, it worked, whatever you're doing. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, how do you best hire a customer service? This is obviously integral into your business people. That's your front line of not just support, but salespeople sort of, you know, making sure people are supported. Um, how do you hire a good customer support person? So we've got a process that we go through um, and I think, you know, a lot of it happened. A lot of it starts with like what um, a lot of it starts with attitude. Everything starts with attitude. I think, you know, um, um, you mentioned, you know, your grandfather, like what's that book uh, man search for meaning. I think it is. Victor yeah, Frankl. So yeah. I, I've read, yeah. I read that. Yeah. So like, the same, I mean, everything starts with attitude and it's like, you need to get people with you with the right attitude on your team. So in my mind, yes, you, I want somebody technical to be on the support team, but I can teach them. I will accept them on the team if they have a, just an awesome attitude and mm. they're going to do whatever it takes to make somebody happy. And they realize in their heart, they can do that job. That's more important than being extremely technical, but be, but thinking that, the world revolves around you and what, right? So yeah. I think a lot of it starts with attitude. I can teach the technical part. We can, we, we have training for that stuff, right? So start with attitude and then basically we have a whole process we go through, but I mean, we'll put a job out and we'll get maybe, um, I don't know, because we're a remote company, we just get a ton of, 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 of response. We might get 300 uh, um, applicants in. Um, and we do look for people that are technical and that, and that understand because you have to go in, diagnose, a Linux computer. You've got to know what Linux is. Um, you've got to know, right. You've got to know, um, you've got to understand how to go onto and download a debug app on your iPhone and go through the process of, of QA. That kind of I thing. would not be hired by you, Dave. Yeah, I would not so, even, I mean, I would not even pass. You have to, right. So we, yeah. those, there's certain hurdles, but after, but after that, you know, it's, it's a lot about attitude. And then, you know, so we go through, we might interview, we might interview five out of, out of that group of 300 and then make a choice. Um, and, and how do you bake in that those questions or in the hire process that you measure 
attitude? Like if people are, have their best, want to put their best foot forward. Yeah. How that's do a big you, part of it. That's yeah. a big part of it. So you do autom- we do um, like, it, like audit, like forms, right. That have, um, you know, I think it's like seven to 10 questions that you have to answer when you come through the application process. So we'll get those things and we'll, 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 you'll have, um, you know, Hey, give us a link to your LinkedIn profile. If you can't give me the link to your LinkedIn profile, chances are you're not, you're disqualified. Yeah. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like there's certain disqualification. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, yeah, it's a process of, and, and if, if you, if I ask you, uh, please explain your, why you'd be a good fit for this role. Like, and you wrote me a, a three word, you know, phrase, you know, Hey, uh, 10 years customer service experience. That's not good. That's not good enough for us. Like we want, uh, I want a long paragraph. I want you to a- have the qualities that I want. So we believe that it's best to provide a one uh, touch um, response. And I want to solve that problem the first time that you have, a, you have an issue. I don't want, if we don't get a response back from you, that's actually really good. Um, so in order to do that, we've got to provide a really long, right? Like response that is very detailed with yeah. thought through. And I want to see that same response happening in your mind and that same attitude happening in your mind before um, I have to, I can't, that's one thing I can train you a lot of stuff. That's hard to train because yeah. you're going to resent that if that's not your natural um, place or the, your natural way of working then you're going to start to resent this, this job. And so it's about fit. And so we look mm-hmm. for long, you know, long responses there and like, you know, a detailed response, well thought through. So you can do a lot just with that, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so one of then, some of the ways you measure attitude is one, you have a couple of questions baked in there, um, but you see more of how they respond. So is it really long? Is it really detailed? Is it really friendly? Like those type of things. Yes. Right. And then you, and then like, for instance, we'll say, uh, we'll, if you, we, we do most over email. So like you'll get an email address. We'll, we'll, what's your email address? Okay. So if we write you an email and you don't respond back for three days, you, you give me all this long, this long, you know, um, great response, but you, but you're not responding back in three days. Again, that's not, something that we're looking for. I understand you might have a job or whatever. We're looking for somebody that actually that that's boom. They're, they're, they're responding back to you within, you know, seven, seven to 10 minutes sometimes, you know, like fast. And it's like, that's the person's going to rise up and say, this is a person that has the attitude, the experience that we need. They're good enough for an interview. Um, Are there any other questions that you find, you know, teases out, like someone has a good attitude, like you mentioned, you know, what would make you a good fit? Are there any other questions that you find that you're really looking at in that interview process? Um, I, you know, not a ton. I mean, I ask a lot of personal questions, like personal meaning like, what are your hobbies? I want to know your hobbies. If you're, if we're hiring for a developer, I want to know that you, that you enjoy taking apart computers. Like I want to know that you enjoy that. I want to know some, a lot of our developers are, are very active. They would like to hike. They like to bike. Um, they like to do that kind of thing. Um, so there, you know, it doesn't, there's not, there's no wrong answer. A lot of people like video games, that kind of thing, but at least I want to know that you're trying to go, um, do something for yourself, to better yourself. A lot of people we hire have tried to start their own businesses or even have businesses on the side that they're running. Um, or had, they've tried to build an app or they've tried to go do something or they, or they, uh, you know, they contribute to, um, open source technologies or they, you know, whatever it is that gets them going. They have like, a passion for something. Yeah. Just, yeah. A passion for something, you know, not just because it, I think that, you know, that, that mindset of being able to go do something and tackle it is very important. And um, whatever that is, it, that doesn't necessarily matter as much as long as you're trying to do something. Um, so that would be one thing that I, I look for you know, a mm. lot. I, we also look for cultural fit. You know, we will, I like to see somebody that can laugh and have fun and smile. Um, and, 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 you know, ask questions. Um, so yeah, that would be. David, it, it's apparent, you know, from the website and the company <laughs> that transparency is very important to you. And, uh, yeah. And, um, you know, you promote the core value of transparency and you share your growth metrics publicly mm-hmm. On the site, talk about that decision to do that. That's, 
I think for some people completely counterintuitive why yeah you know. and I don't yeah I don't I, that was um that wasn't a huge decision I mean we made that decision back when we were first starting you know like mm-hmm. back when we were at zero right so like you like transfer is zero like no big deal yeah exactly. <laughs> at that point that's an easy decision right and the reason why we made that was kind of selfish actually because what we thought at, you know when we were building this company was like hey we need a story we need a hook and that's it's a lot easier for us to get you know attention from um, media and from anybody so, you know somebody writing like like yourself for example that it's just a lot easier that's something that 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 some that a podcast host um, or that a customer will latch a hold of and say okay yes this company has customers they've got eleven thousand customers I can see that it's kind of cool that they share that I, I'm now part of a like I'm part of, it's because I mean, you don't know. I mean, if somebody is, uh, they might, somebody can put together a good website and have three customers. Their software is crap. You know, I want, I like it that people can see we have eleven thousand customers. Um, mm-hmm. That is that adds trust. So anything to add trust, anything that says, hey, I'm not hiding anything, anything, right? right? So, but if we're if we're writing an empl- uh, a, a reporter and we're saying, hey, you know, um, uh, so say it's from Indianapolis. I'm located in Indianapolis. Um, Hey, you know, we're a local Indianapolis company. Reporters don't care, you know, whatever. We're software. We share our numbers. Now they that peaks their that's kind of cool. That's different. You know, so that that was kind of the the decision point uh, yeah. with that. I mean, later on, I mean, there's levels of transparency, right? Yeah. Like sharing your customers or social proof, sharing, you know, some of the the amazing companies that you guys have helped is social proof and credibility. Um, but I would say it's more rare for people to share their number, actual numbers. Yeah. Was that a tough decision? And did you, like, what was the thought process of, well, some people say, well, I don't really want our competitors knowing exactly yeah. how we're doing. Um, so what, what was that? How did you come to that decision? That's come about more recently now because people can see that we're growing. People can see. So there, there, there are thoughts there. And I mean, I've there's seen, a lot of, there's a moat, right? You need a lot of developers. You need a lot of customer service. So there's some moat there of they can't just, oh, they're growing. Oh, Let's yeah. just hop into doing right. this time tracking thing. But, but still, there's still competitors out there. Yeah. And there's competitors. There, a lot of people, certainly we have built a lot of competitors based on having that page up there for sure. And that, that's not a great feeling, uh, you know, <laughs> but, but you still keep feeling. it. So there must be a, like a, a reason and yeah, and why it's you just, do it, it's just it? a mat. I think it's a matter of, for us, it's a matter of, we know how hard we, we know how hard it's been to execute. We know how hard it's been to build what we built. Um, mm-hmm. And we believe, we really believe that there's enough for everybody. You know, we're not trying to, it doesn't matter in the end. It really doesn't matter in the there's end. There's enough All, people if, to go around. If, yeah, yeah, and if we're we believe that the soft that this world that that the the soft like the industry we're in the, the niche we're in is a is a is a good growing niche, and we're really trying to help our customers. Um, and if they choose us or some other product, I, I, I want what's best for the customer in the end. I really do. And um, you know, I, I just think it's more about just helping helping the community and helping. Um, the customer, and if we're doing the right thing, which we believe the right thing is to just to build, the, listen to our customers, and build the put our heads down and build the best product for our customers. Um, it does the rest of it doesn't really matter. We will be fine. You know, we'll, yeah. if we can do that every day. We'll be fine. You know, Dave. One thing I read that struck me on your site is you said you've got to feel pain when you lose. An entrepreneur's life is all about surviving the pain and sacrifice that it takes to win uh, until you achieve freedom. I don't do this for the money. I haven't been paid in two years. I do it for the freedom. Talk about that period where you hadn't been paid in two years. Yeah. And that was, that was a uh, kind of a rough period, but I mean, you know, uh, luckily my wife um, w- was making income at the time. But, um, because people I, see, you know, 34,000 customers, like this guy's made it, yeah. you know, it was an easy journey, you know, Talk about that time where you didn't pay yourself for, for yeah, a number well, of years. Yeah, that, well, that's just a business. I think that was just a business decision. So, um, you know, I had had a few other businesses in the past. Um, so I, was, I had some savings to live off of, you know, first of all. So not everyone's in that same, is in that same uh, position. Um, we actually had a lot of pickup. We had a lot of people 
coming in the door all during that time where, yeah, we weren't making any money. We weren't personally making any money at that point in time. We weren't paying ourselves. We couldn't, we couldn't pay ourselves. We were putting it back into the company. You're building the infrastructure. What's that? You're building the infrastructure. Yeah. 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 And so, um, but all during that time, you know, we, we had, we were still getting good, um, pickup from people coming in the door saying, I really like this software. I really like what you're doing. I really like the company. You've done a great job with the UI or whatever they're saying. Right. And, and that we weren't advertising to get these customers. They were just coming to us. And so, yeah, I'm not being paid now, but I know that I, that I've got a good thing going. I know that we've got a good thing going. And so it's worth investing in that. Um, and I, and you know, we know it's a matter of time, you know, and I think that's what it was about. You know, it's not, it wasn't like we were just, I think there's a balance. I want to be, uh, because a lot of time I do, I do enjoy talking. I realized that founding a company is not an easy thing. And I realized that, um, there's a lot of founders that really fall in love with their ideas and they, they, they spend too much time on each one of on their ideas without making profit. Profit is the most important. I, 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 you know, I want to be clear about that. Profit is the most important because if you're, you know, if every day is a choice that you make. And so at that point in time, I was making the choice, yes, to invest in my company because I felt really good about where we were going, what we were building. I had a good partner. I had a good team. We had good software. We had people coming in the door. Um, but if, if I don't have, a, if I'm knocking on the door and no one's responding day in, day out for it, that would not have been the case, you know? Yeah. So I think you got to really um, understand, you got to see the demand in order to make that decision. At least I did. How do you decide on pricing? It seems like a tough thing to, to figure out. A lot out. of it's based on, a lot of it's based on the market. Um, what our competitors charge, meaning like T-Sheets. T-Sheets is a, is a competitor of ours. They're a timesheet solution, right? So we're a timesheet solution. They're a timesheet solution. So, um, you know, they're charging five bucks a month or whatever they're charging. I don't know. I think they raised the price not at eight. I, I, I don't even know what they're charging right now. But at some point, they were like five bucks a month for, per user. Um, and so... I mean, we're not going to be able to charge, I mean, you know, realistically, we, it's hard for us to charge 20. We can now because we have features they don't have um, for a specific niche. Um, but we, you know, it's hard for us to come in the door and charge, but we also do a lot of testing. So we'll test prices and we'll test and we'll understand, hey, this is too high or this is too low. Yeah. Um, we have various different um, um, tiers. So you know, we have basic, which is $7 a month, premium, which is 10 and enterprise, which is 20, um, currently. And that, that, that's come through data. Most of what we do comes through data. So that has been tested to be the most, uh, the best, um, option for us, you know, through kind of like market customers. demands with, you want to provide the best. I always think of it people look for the least expensive option sometimes or free option. And I feel like I never want to go with those because I want the company, like you said, the profit to be, to be sustainable, be around for a long time. So to sustain it, you really need to charge to provide, you know, the, the right mentality is they're going to roll it back into customer service and the company yeah. is, a, you know, what the market de, you know, demands and also, you got to pay the pe good people to provide the service too. So it's, it's yeah. a really tough balance, I think. Yeah. There's been a, there's been a, um, there's been a lot of things we've looked at. We've looked at, for instance, like offering like our timesheet solution, like time, let's say timesheets, invoicing timesheets, meaning if you're tracking on the web timer, you know, for like say $3 a user. Um, there's some things that we've looked at, but, but this is just what we've lined on. We used to be, um, for a long time we were $5 and then we offered a premium tier, which I had some more, but a lot of it too comes down with, um, the expenses. Like a lot of that data that we track is just super expensive for servers and that kind of thing. So, uh, because there's so many, like we have like right now, I mean, I don't even know the number, but I, it's something probably, probably right now, 1.6 million screenshots a day taken that it's they're being stored. Like yeah. in terms of apps and URLs, I mean, in the millions per, so to manage all that data coming in um, is expensive because it's got to be stored. So it's like, how are you going to, um, so that's why we have to include certain things in that premium tier 
because you have to you have to pay more to get that to literally to store the data. Yeah. Dave, you know, one thing that struck me with your story too is that it wasn't that your parents were super entrepreneurial. You just yeah. you had that bug, right? Yeah. And um I thought there was a really I, I don't know what that moment was like, but but your dad, there was a moment where your dad offered to pay for a course for you. Right. Early on. Right. Yeah. And that was out of his nature, it seemed like. To do yeah, that. it was um it was um I don't know what that I don't I don't know you know, I don't know why that because it, it it I I don't know if it, it you know, he just said, you know, hey, he and I was lucky enough to have him pay my way through college, yeah. which which made it interesting because you know, he has been, you said they're not entrepreneurial, they're not, um, they're not, you know, they're, they're very risk averse. I'm very, I'm more like risk taking. Um, so, you know, imagine that he had just paid my way through college. Um, and I get the corporate job that he always has, that basically is the return on his investment, right? So your son now gets the corporate job and I'm saying, you know what? I'm just not fulfilled in this job. I'm just pushing reports. Doesn't mean much to me. I'm not happy. I'm telling him this, you know, on the golf course or whatever. Um, and he's like, well, you know, if, so this course was like 500 bucks, which wasn't cheap. Cause that, that's against his nature to, he, he'll spend that on me, but not on himself ever. Right. Like come on a guy that wears a pair of shoes for the past, for seven years before you right? seven to 10 years. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, it's 500 bucks. And he said, you know, I, hey, I'll, if you promise me that you'll implement this, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll buy this for you. And so I, I made that promise. I did implement it and it paid off. That, that's what led me this, down this whole path. Yeah. But he saw that you, you had that, what was it that you had that just kind of fire that you just wanted to do your own thing? Yeah, I think that was, I think that's just my attitude. I just don't, I just, it's hard for me to um, it's, it would be very hard for me to work for somebody else. It, I mean, I think that if it's a very good match, I'd probably do that. But like, I just believe that like my, the, my, the, the most value I can create and give to the world is when I can uh, start with something from zero, like nothing, just a thought and idea. And that, that idea then is implemented and it's new. Like, I think that's value that I give to the world and, you know, then value comes back. and. Um, like that's what I, I really believe that like, and, and without being, if you're just pushing a report that somebody's telling you to create and you're just doing what you're told to be do, you know, it, it, that's not creating a ton of value. Right. It's just being a cog in the wheel, you know? And so, and that's something we even try to do with our people. Like, uh, you know, Hey, have an opinion, believe in something, tell us how to do things better, create value inside the company. Like we teach, we, we really try to get people to do that because I think that that, when you have that moment of being able to like, Hey, I, that was my idea. Now it's live in code, right? And I can see that out there implemented. That's what helps us to retain a lot of people and help, helps people to actually enjoy their job. It, it you know, it adds a dimension of pride to what they do, you know? Yeah. Um, it's so that's interesting, where, you know, that it comes full circle because that was originally why you just, or, you know, at least why you said, I didn't really like that job. I was pushing reports, but now you yeah. kind of solved that problem for people because it does it automatically. Like your right. software actually solves that. So it actually yeah. lets them do be more fulfilled probably in their job. Maybe they would have been pushing more reports in their job. And right. So well, they're chasing, I'm solving the problem of them. They're, they're yeah. chasing down time. Sheets. That's their job. That's the entrepreneur's job. In most cases, chasing down timesheets, trying to get things organized. Like I want them to live a better life and to not be so stressed out all the time about, you know, the little things. If you're stressed about the big things, okay, that's, that's out of my realm. I can't fix your sales problems with my software, but I can make your team more efficient and more, you know, your whole business really more fit, take away those admin tasks and make that more streamlined and efficient. And that's something that gives me pride because I know that then they can choose how they reinvest that time and that yeah. energy. Yeah. I think I want to encourage people to check out hubstaff.com. Also check out their blog because they have a really cool timeline of 
different aspects uh, along different milestones and aspects of their company, you know, and so that are super interesting, you know, including some of their uh, choices to switch email platforms, why they dumped one and why they picked up uh, a new email marketing platform. So there's just some uh, really interesting posts that I encourage everyone to check out uh, along your, your journey. Um, and obviously I gravitate towards a couple and one, um, so it was, so, I don't know if I was, should be surprised, but maybe I was, cause most people don't mention it, but one of the decisions you made of starting a podcast. Yeah. Right. So what was that? Why did you make that decision? How did that help? Um, yeah. And that, that, that was, that was a cool, I think, uh, thing to do. Um, it was basically, we, our number one client and customer at that point in time were agencies. So we said, how can you reach multiple agents and agencies, digital marketing, people that had issues with everything I just mentioned. How much time is somebody working on specific projects? How do I invoice that? I'm charging, right? I've, I'm, I've got people working for me but I'm billing them out at different rates per client, right? I bill out for one client, I bill uh, out at $30 an hour for another client, I bill at $70, same person. So you can solve those problems with HubStep. Um, it's very hard to solve that problem uh, and, and do the math and do the invoicing and things like that without having a solution to actually, you know, figure that out. Um, so, you know, the podcast came down to just a different channel for reaching that customer. What channel is that person interested in? Um, and like, I'm a big podcast person in general, like, cause I, I, you know, listen to podcasts as I'm running or as I'm mowing the lawn or as I'm driving, like I do not like wasted time. Like, right. So, um, I, I don't sit there and, you know, mow the lawn and, you know, I, I'm you trying book to, on or you're, you're yeah, I'm just trying to think yeah. through things, whether it's an audio book or a podcast you, and, and, and it helps me think a lot of times it's non-business related. It's, um, you know, things about self-improvement or just, what are your favorite that. podcasts? Yeah. What, yeah. What exactly. are your favorites? What are you? Oh, my, to? um, so like, I like, um, I like a lot of like, like I follow a lot of sports. So I listen to a lot of sports. Like I listen to like live sports, like, like not live sports, like in real time, but like, um, meaning radio shows. Right. So they all have podcasts now. Um, I listen to a lot of like, um, I listen to a lot of like biographies and like, and, and like, I, I listen, I do a lot of like, like war strategy stuff. I relate that to business a lot and how mm. to build teams and how to motivate people and how to, I listen to a lot of that stuff. His a lot of history. Mm -hmm. Um, so like th that kind of stuff. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, so I, I just don't like wasted time. So I, I do, I do that a lot. And, um, you know, it just became apparent that that was a new way of, of reaching a customer base that we didn't have in our, in our marketing arsenal. Um, we had the blog, but that was a, and that was really good. The prop, the only problem is that we kind of, um, lost steam in terms of, kind of like new people to interview the whole, the whole, um, the whole point of that pod, the, the positioning of that podcast was interviews like this is right here, but I had lost inter agents. We would interview agency owners to find out how they, their stories and how they grew their agency. Mm -hmm. And so I guess we just kind of felt like over time that, that, you know, people had gotten what they need. We had done what, cause the podcast still around where people can listen to the archive, but the new ones were kind of like becoming, it wasn't becoming better. It was, it was kind of staying stagnant. So that Who was your the, favorite interviews. Who were the, some of the favorite people you featured? I didn't do the companies. podcast. So I, I didn't do the podcast. Oh, okay. I didn't do the, did the interviewing. So I don't, yeah, I didn't do the interviewing. Um, yeah. Th yeah. Usually I customer of ours. Yeah. Um, so what about, Software tools. What are your favorites? Like obviously, you know, excluding hub staff is one of the favorites. Mm -hmm. um, what do you use? You mentioned Slack. What other tools, software? So, you know, we, hub staff does, we have a prod, we have a project management tool as well. So like project management system. So, you know, um, like, um, 
you know, it's, it's Kanban, so you can drag and drop that kind of thing. You can, but I mean, so that is outside the realm of time tracking. So it's it, that, and we use that internally, but like, that's where I would go is any project management. So that's number one, that's number one above everything else. It's like some kind of system where whatever you use, Asana, you know, um, Tass, Trello, whatever, just some way to, to document and blueprint you know, what, um, how you, you know, do business. I like mind mapping software a lot. Um, I use, you know, flow charting and processes a lot. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we do a lot in Google docs. We we do almost everything. Google docs, um, it's free. Um, you know, but all of our specs for software development are all on Google docs, all of our specs for marketing. We use specs for marketing. Um, that's really how we kind of, develop what we're going to work on for the quarter is all in a Google doc. And then basically we have a plan how we're going to implement that. And then we have, you know, the assignment and then we go to um, help staff tasks in our case, which is our project management tool and basically assign those tasks out to people to have worked on. And that's how we communicate and we comment and you can add mention people and then you get it back. So, you know, our business is made up of Google docs, help staff tasks, hub staff, um, uh, Slack is a lot of Slack is for culture and culture development and remote company. Um, and then we, you know, obviously we have a lot of development um, specific tools that we use um, to build our software. Yeah. Um, we use um, SCM Rush for like search and, and information. Yeah. Um, Dave, last question. And, Really appreciate your time and sharing your philosophies and core values and your journey. Everyone should check, check out hubstaff.com. And I really believe, you know, I should have had this a long, long, long time ago. Um, <laughs> Glad because it, it makes me personally more productive. We, what you track and what you focus on expands. And so if you're tracking actually the tasks you're doing and, and you know, it allows me to figure out where should I best spend my time. And what am I spending? You can't, you don't know that unless you know what you're spending your time on in the right. first place. And so um, it's been really valuable to see what am I spending time on? And also it keeps me on track from not wasting time because I see that thing ticking. And like, if I go off to Facebook, I'm like, well, I kind of have to stop that timer and now I'm not being productive. So it really helps me zero. So I think, I believe if you're a staff of one, you should be using it. Personally, yeah. you know, lots, lots of people do. Yeah. Um, let alone obviously having an insight into what the whole team is doing, you know? So yes. I, I encourage people to check out hubstaff.com and check out their software. Um, become a user, even if you're one, a person of one, I don't care who you are, you know? So yeah. check it out. Um, I always ask since it's inspired insider, Dave, what's been a low moment that you had to push through and what's been a proud moment, especially proud moment. Um, What's been more of like a challenging time that you had to push through? Um, I, you know, there's, there's been hub staff came about from a need um, of just, I'll go back to that time where like just this, the extreme stress of running a business and not knowing if what you're doing is right, not knowing, Hey, you know what? I suck at management, like whatever it is. I, coming to these realizations of saying, you know what, I need help. Um, and, you know, like that moment for me was back when I was having my golf business. And it's like, I just, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't make things, I couldn't make things, you know, um, couldn't make things happen. I couldn't make the things that I wanted to have happen. I couldn't move things along faster. I wasn't, it wasn't bringing in the type of money it used to. It was kind of on the decline. Um, and, you know, just having to kind of say, okay, it's time to, it's time to move on from this. It's time to move on and, and do something different. Um, and so, you know, those are always, you know, hard moments. Um, you have something you run for, you know, nine years and it's, it's time to move on, you know, but just it's like your baby. Think, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the best thing is just to, I, I, I advise always to just start something when you start to have those feelings, you know, you got to start to move on. Uh, before the end is there you can't you know so you start to kind of see allows you to kind of test the waters and see what might be your next thing 
before the end has, has yeah. come. I mean, that's what you did with your full-time job. I mean, you yeah. were mood lighting, waking up at five in the morning, trying to make something work so that, that you were, yeah. it wasn't like quick cold turkey, burn the boats. You're like, no, I just hop on the next boat. I didn't burn this boat. So that's a really I've always smart. Done, I've done that with, with three different things now. Yeah. Yeah. That's smart. Um, what about on the flip side? What's been a especially proud moment in the, I think, the journey? Yeah, I think proud. I think pride right now. I think pride currently right now, like because I've worked, I'm going through this exercise right now, actually today, later on today, of of um, of building out our future vision and where we want to go, hmm. um, which is hard for me. You've really got to sit down and and kind of turn everything off and and try to get in the mindset of where you want to go and and what you want to do uh, with the company and how you're going to uh, make an impact on the world and it seems, you know, it seems like that's something that you, but it, it's always adjusting. It's always, it, it, I mean, at least it is like, it adjusts every, you know, let's say three years or five, four years, that kind of thing. Um, and as I'm sure, you never know if you're going down the right path. You never know if the path you're going down is right. Like you never know if what you're, there's not that immediate feedback. You've got to go with what you feel like is the right thing to do. Right. You've got to have reasons for doing that. And so, you know, I'm just proud that right now, that like we have a company that honestly has helped people stay. Uh, there's been a lot of people that we've helped out from people from, um, you know, that we've introduced through our software and have had jobs and can feed their families and have the job that they want dream jobs. They never could have gotten if they work, let's say in, they, they live in Idaho in a, on a farm and they have somebody from Chicago hire them and now they can do what they, they can have a better life because of what we do. And that makes me, you know, just people from uh, somebody from the Philippines might meet somebody from California and now they have a great relationship and they're, you know, able to have a job they never could have had locally, you know, so that, and that whole movement is happening now. It makes me proud that like we have a software that can be in the mix and in the middle um, and really a leader in terms of helping to move that forward. Um, and so, it, you know, that, and it makes me happy that business owners can be happier uh, also using the software because they get, a, they get a lot of advantages as well, you know? So um, yeah. Yeah. yeah that, thank that, you, Dave. I totally appreciate you and, and what you've created. Everyone check out hubstaff.com and I want to be the first one to thank you. Yeah. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a peach if you find the same